Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shadesha Green, and I am a 2021 Canals Fellow in the in NOAA's Climate Program Office. And I'm here to welcome you all to our seventh webinar in our um, nine, sorry, in our National Integrated Heat Health Information System Urban Heat Island Campaign um, Community of Practice webinar series. So, Nora, do you want to change the slide? I guess I'll just start. Okay. So in our first webinar, we learned about the physical hazard of extreme heat on several spatial scales. In our second webinar, we learned about constructing heat vulnerability indices. In our third webinar of the series, we looked at investigating options and examined how concrete policies in pl put in place can help heat risk. In the fourth webinar, we feature communities that have implemented solutions to make their built environment more resilient to heat. And in our fifth webinar, we talked about green cooling infrastructure. And last week in our sixth webinar, we explored theme, the themes of community engagement, outreach, and education. All of the webinars I just listed are have been following the uh, Climate Resilience Toolkit Steps to Resilience. Um, and today we are in our final seventh webinar. Uh, we're moving into a discussion about how heat planning can be prioritized and integrated by city planners. And to discuss this topic, we have our moderator, Lad Keith, an assistant professor in planning at the University of Arizona, and he will lead us in a Q&A panel style session. Before we begin, I'd just like to list a few more reminders these webinars are being recorded and it will be placed on the NIHIS page as well as our YouTube channel. We are encouraging everyone to place their questions in the question panel that you'll see on the side. For the speakers, you can name a specific speaker or just drop a question. Um, and please do that throughout so that we can have a more engaging conversation. And with that, I'm going to hand it over now to you, Lad. Great, thank you so much, Shay. Next slide. So again, my name is Lad Keith, and I just wanted to thank Noah and Ihis again for organizing this Community of Practice webinar series. Um, again, I'm an assistant professor in planning at the University of Arizona, and also a research affiliate of CLEMIS, which is um, climate assessment for the Southwest, one of NOAA's regional integrated science and assessment programs. And I primarily research how communities across the United States are planning and governing for extreme heat. So as she said, um, we'll begin this webinar today with a short presentation by myself, followed by uh, one by Sarah Miro of Arizona State University on heat governance. And then Sarah's going to cover a survey that we did of cities across the United States and how they're planning for extreme heat. And then after that, we'll have the panel discussion. And again, featuring Kizzy Charles Guzman of New York City, Mark Hartman of the City of Phoenix, and Jane Gilbert from Miami-Dade County. So I'll frame some of my opening remarks around a comment piece recently published in Nature with co-authors Sarah Miro, Kelly Turner, Dave Hondula, and James Arnott about the importance of advancing heat governance as a concept and kind of a practical framework for addressing heat. So as we know, communities, states, and the federal government is much further behind in addressing heat than other climate risks like sea level rise, wildfires, and flooding. Um, and the lack of familiarity with addressing heat as a hazard um, also includes the lack of tested legal structures and lack of consistent information sources for communities. And all of those have really slowed our collective ability to plan and address heat in the same way that we do for other um, climate hazards. So to address heat, we must uh, support the uh, development of heat governance, which in this uh, paper we define as the actors, strategies, processes, and institutions that, get to, that guide decision-making for mitigating and managing heat as a hazard. And although it has governance in the title, um, it's not government strictly. So we're um, being inclusive of nonprofit, public sector, private sector, um, community engagement as well. So governance really takes the entire community. So just uh, to go over some of some concepts within the six guiding principles that we um, wrote about in this paper, the first one of course is advancing um, heat equity as a principle. And so heat equity must be central to any effort um, to address heat, given how inequitable the impacts of heat truly are. And the webinar series has covered that in great detail. So much of the media attention recently has focused on the difference between land surface temperatures and community that often have roots in historic racist land use practices like redlining. 
And these inequities um, are critical to understand, and um, the NYHIS's heat mapping campaign can help communities identify um, which areas of those communities have higher land surface temperatures than other. But of course, heat inequity is much more pervasive than just what shows up on a land surface temperature map. And community members are not just static points on a map that kind of reside in that one area and don't move around. So of course, when we think about heat equity holistically, we have to think about affordable and accessible uh, quality housing options, healthcare access, energy access, indoor cooling, um, workplace and school safety, um, as well as reliable and safe transportation. And all of those uh, options play a role in uh, personal heat exposure for all of our community members. So of course, because heat has real impacts to communities, health, quality of life, economic activity, infrastructure, energy and water use, um, the efforts to advance heat equity must really account for all of those underlying systematic inequities and how they intersect with all of those topics. So beyond just what shows up on a single map. Uh, our second principle is looking at mitigating heat. And so of course, many communities have already begun strategies to mitigate heat or reduce the contribution of the built environment and its processes such as waste heat to the urban heat island effect. Um, there's growing evidence that communities, though, are focusing on a very small set of tools that are truly available for them for heat mitigation and leaving some really important strategies out. And I'll let Sarah discuss that further, what we found in our survey of how um, communities are addressing heat mitigation. Another component of heat governance is the management of heat. And so outside of just mitigating heat, of course, we have to think through how we'll prepare and respond um, to heat risk. So that can include public health or emergency management efforts. And one thing to watch out for with this is that there's a tendency to treat heat as an acute risk only. So focusing more on extreme heat events like the Pacific Northwest heat wave that we saw in June of this summer. And while that's certainly important because that heat wave killed at least um, 1,200 people over the United States and Canada, um, we also have to look at heat as a chronic issue. And that ties uh, directly back to a lot of the systematic inequities I was talking about before. And so just as an example here in Arizona, 80% of our heat related deaths um, and mortality come from outside of official heat warning periods. So kind of depending on where you are in the country, um, chronic heat can be even more deadly than that acute heat. And so heat management efforts must account for both. Another um, principle that we talked about is developing metrics and the webinar series uh, uh, covered this quite well too. And so the basic principle here is that we just need better and more consistent metrics to understand and measure how we are mitigating and managing heat and how those um, strategies are working. So for example, urban planners may look to seek urban heat, as I said, um, and so they may look at reductions in land surface temperature maps, but public health officials may track heat related illnesses and mortality and then emergency managers may focus on visits to cooling centers. So in a lot of communities, these insights are still rarely, rarely shared with each other and um, kind of siloed off in their disciplines and we're not learning from each other and kind of uh, tackling these holistically. And then these metrics are also very inconsistent across communities and across the whole country as well. And of course, uh, the topic today is how we actually coordinate these issues. And um, so while communities face many challenges coordinating efforts for any planning topic or climate risk, um, heat has additional challenges because, as I mentioned, heat governance is much less mature than our governance structures for other climate risks. And so again, because heat management and mitigation strategies often take place in silos, um, we really have to kind of forge new partnerships and look at building new bridges that haven't necessarily existed before. And so I'm really excited to hear what our panelists have to say about how their communities are addressing that. And then finally, we call on national governments to support existing heat-focused institutions such as NIHIS, um, and then uh, continue to build new institutions as well when they're needed. And so at the local level, we're seeing a very quick evolution of heat governance. And so, of course, this year we had the world's first chief heat officer, um, so Jane Gilbert, who is joining us today. Um, and then shortly after that, the city of Phoenix announced it was creating the first publicly funded Office of Heat Mitigation and Response. And Mark Hartman will discuss um, how the city of Phoenix is approaching that. So that's exciting, but there's still 19,519 local municipal governments in the United States, very diverse sizes and resources. And many of those smaller and rural governments don't necessarily have a planner, let alone the capacity to have a dedicated staff person for just heat. And so that's really where institutions like NICUS um, can play a really big role um, to help share lessons learned and provide guidance um, so we can help make sure that all communities in the country are really advancing heat governance and addressing heat for all of their community members. And with that, um, I will turn it over to you, Sarah.
And Sarah, I think you're muted if you want to unmute. Yes, thank you. Yep. <laughs> Hi, so. um, I'm, yeah, I'm Sarah Miro. I'm an assistant professor um, in the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning at Arizona State University. Um, and today I'm going to talk, uh, as Lad mentioned, a little bit more about what the current status of heat planning is in the US. And this is really based on a survey that Lad and I conducted on planners and communities across the country. Um, so if you go to the next slide, the survey was really designed to examine um, how planners are thinking about heat risk, um, how concerned they are, the impacts they're seeing from heat in their communities, what kind of information sources they use, um, as well as what information sources they need um, in order to understand heat risks, what strategies they're actually using to address uh, heat, as well as the barriers they face in you know, ramping up those uh, efforts to address it. And finally, what types of plans they uh, are, are integrating heat into and addressing. Um, so in conducting that survey, we actually use sort of two samples to really try and get a, a comprehensive understanding of what the current state of planning is in the US. Um, the first was a stratified random sample of planners in cities of different sizes, um, because we know that capacities do really vary by city size, as Lad mentioned, um, as well as cities in different climate regions, because obviously uh, different areas face really different kinds of heat um, and, and heat risk. And so we, we buried that. And then a second sample that was really a convenience sample, sample capturing um, the perspective of planning professionals more broadly, especially those that we're taking an active interest in heat or climate hazards. Um, so now I'm gonna you know, jump right into some of the, the key results um, from, these, from this survey. For the sake of time today, I'm really just gonna focus on that first uh, stratified random sample because I think it gives a more representative picture of what the status of heat planning is. Um, but again, at their, and generally the results were fairly similar across those two uh, samples. So moving into the next slide, um, looking at heat risk perceptions. So we see that the majority of uh, planners that responded to our survey indicated that they were at least somewhat to very concerned about extreme heat impacts overall, um, as well as the economic, environmental, and health impacts specifically. Um, so between those planners, we found were most concerned about the impacts to environment and public health, a little bit less so uh, those economic impacts. Um, and when we look at the contributors to uh, heat, it seemed that planners were more concerned about climate change um, than they were uh, from or about extreme heat uh, from the urban heat island effect. So moving on then to, to uh, more specific impacts, um, how, you know, what kinds of sectors were being impacted by heat, we see a, the big takeaway here is that more than 80% of the planners said that their communities were impacted by heat in some way. Um, the top five most commonly reported impacts were to energy and water use, urban vegetation, public health, and quality of life. Um, on the sort of flip side, we see that retail and economic development um, were reported as sort of less or were less commonly reported uh, impacts among those we asked. Um, oh, sorry, if you can move to the next slide. There's the, those different impacts. Um, and then moving on to the next slide, um, we asked, as I mentioned, about what kinds of heat-related information planners were using um, in, their, in their efforts to address heat. And over 70% of our respondents said that they were using some kind of heat information. Um, the most common were vegetation maps, heat, uh, the heat index, and historical temperature data, we see that future scenarios were actually the least commonly used uh, type of information. And we also asked planners whether they were not using information because they didn't think it was useful or because it wasn't available, um, with the idea being that the, the latter information, this information that they're not using because it's unavailable, is actually really an information gap, which you know researchers as well as climate service, service providers have a real opportunity to fill. And so what we see in terms of those, those information gaps are that uh, are really centered on future scenarios, land surface temperature maps, 
air temperature uh, maps and heat vulnerability maps. So these are all things that, that planners said they weren't using because they didn't have access to them, not because they didn't think they would be useful. Uh, moving into the next slide, um, as Lad mentioned in the introduction, you know, planning for heat really involves both heat mitigation as well as heat management. So addressing it holistically would really bring these two different uh, sides together, right? Um, and what we know is that that often, in many cases, they they tend to be siloed. Um, so we developed uh, this framework for essentially categorizing the the different types of strategies that we would have within these uh, mitigation and management uh, uh, categorizations. And we specifically asked planners which uh, strategies within these, um, these categories they had implemented in their communities. And if you go to the next slide, you can see um, that around 90% of the planners said that they had implemented one or more heat strategies. So I think this is, um, this is very promising. The majority said that they were implementing urban forestry, emergency response strategies, weatherization, and man-made man -made shade. So the majority of all of these communities said that they, they had implemented these uh, to address heat. Um, but some of these other strategies were much more, uh, much less commonly used. So for ex uh, in particular, we see that very few of the communities reported having regulations or actual uh, staff who were dedicated uh, to working on heat. Um, and so, you know, obviously here today we have a few exceptions to that um, in our panel. But, uh, you know, moving on to the next slide, um, you know, we see that there, you know, planners really do perceive that there are a number of barriers um, to advancing heat resilience. I think many of these will, will not be surprising uh, to most people. You know, probably the most significant, um, if we were going to kind of group them together, are those related to human and financial resources or lack thereof, um, as well as sort of political will uh, leadership uh, aspects. So really the, the human uh, aspects. Um, on average, we see uh, that all, um, all of the, the barriers that we asked about were seen as at least a slight barrier. Um, on average, so and most were actually seen as somewhat of a barrier uh, by you know by most respondents. So so some you know significant barriers there. I think that that we need to work to address. Uh, if you go on to the next slide, um, so we also asked uh, which types of plans uh, these communities were addressing heat in, and what we see is that over 65% of the respondents. So the majority said that they were addressing heat in at least one of their plans, um, but we actually see quite a bit of variation in the types of plans. So in fact, no one plan type that we asked about uh, was reported by the majority of uh, the planners as addressing heat, right? So it, it's fairly distributed across um, across the types. So the one that the type that did have the most um, or that the most respondents reported uh, addressing heat in were sustainability, climate, and resilience plans. You know, probably not that uh, surprising. But again, this was only 36% uh, of all of the, the respondents who said that they were addressing heat there. Um, we see that on the flip side, zoning codes and regulations were the least commonly uh, reported areas for addressing heat. And this is a little concerning given that, you know, these are are uh, types of plants that really actually have a lot of regulatory, you know, more teeth, right? So, so we would like to see see heat being addressed there. Um, I think it's interesting also to note that a minority of planners said that their communities were integrating heat into their hazard mitigation plans. Um, and seeing how widespread hazard mitigation plans are, this seems like a, a you know a big opportunity to to scale up heat efforts. Um, so, given that we see that you know there are not that many communities that have standalone heat plans um, and that you know it, it's not really clear that any one plan type uh, really owns heat or primarily is is used to address heat in communities i think it's really important um, to rec recognize that heat is being integrated across different plans um, and so this suggests that you know when we're trying to understand how a community is addressing heat um, you know, or what the, how development is going to shape heat risk in the future, we need to think about the plans as an integrated network, 
right? That actually works together to collectively shape uh, heat risk or heat resilience. And uh, if you go then to you know the next slide, you know we can think of an example, right? So we could have a city where the parks and recreation plan uh, might call for new green space that is really helping to mitigate heat. Well, if you go to the next slide, uh, we could look then at the climate action plan, right? And this might also be helping to mitigate heat through uh, through proposing new vegetated roofs or walls. But if you go to the next slide, um, you could have a transportation plan that suggests adding new surface parking lots and road expansions that would ultimately really exacerbate the urban heat island and in fact negate some of those cooling effects uh, from those other plans. So what I think this shows, if you move on to the next slide, is that, you know, again, we really do need to think about coordinating uh, these different plans and thinking about uh, how they're working or, or not um, as an integrated network. And so uh, with support um, from NOAA's Climate Program Office's Extreme Heat Risk Initiative, Lad and I are currently working uh, with Phil Burke at uh, UNC Chapel Hill, as well as the American Planning Association to develop a really a step-by-step -step process um, that communities can use to identify some of these contradictions uh, that I've, uh, you know, sort of exp explained um, to identify them and to try to assess how the various policies in community plans, like new development or green space, are actually going to affect heat uh, in different parts of the city. And so if you go to the next slide, uh, this plan integration for resilience scorecard for heat, uh, what we're calling the PERSH, builds on uh, the original plan integration for resilience scorecard or PIRS that was developed uh, by Phil Burke and colleagues uh, for flooding. So uh, now we're essentially then adapting it uh, for heat. And so how does this work? Well, what you do is first you identify the you know, various plans that are shaping land use and the built environment in a community. Once you have those plans, you go through them and actually identify the spatially explicit policies uh, that you think would, uh, that would impact heat uh, in our case. You categorize and score them based on whether they would increase or reduce vulnerability to heat. And then you actually add up those scores uh, for each area of the city. So you're looking at uh, just the policies that would have, that would uh, pertain to a particular district um, or neighborhood in the city. Um, you add those up to kind of get a sense of what the overall cumulative impact of that full network of plans would be for uh, different neighborhoods. You can map that out and you can actually compare uh, these maps, these scores with uh, other sources of data on urban heat exposure, uh, vulnerability maps, some of these uh, you know, NIHIS, uh, urban heat island maps for communities, and see whether plans are really targeting um, the highest risk areas, whether they have potential, whether future development has the potential to actually exacerbate heat, or whether it, it might, uh, you know, fairly effectively mitigate it. So uh, if you go to this final slide, uh, just to conclude here, what our survey showed is that most planners are concerned about heat impacts to their communities, especially from climate change. The majority of planners um, have already said that they're being impacted by heat in some way, uh, especially to energy, water use, vegetation, and health. Uh, when addressing heat, uh, planners rely on different sources of information, um, and but there is information that planners don't see as available. So I think there's an opportunity here um, to provide that information to them. Uh, many communities are implementing heat strategies, uh, the most notable being urban vegetation. Uh, the, a little bit of bad news is that planners do see a lot of barriers to effective heat resilience planning, many of which are probably uh, common barriers for other climate hazards as well. Um, most planners said their communities were addressing heat in some plan, um, but the plans varied, which you know points to the need to look at community plans as a network and ensure that policies are synergistic and not working at cross purposes. So our uh, plan integration for resilience scorecard for heat or PERSH, uh, we hope will help communities to uh, to do this and we're piloting it in initially in five uh, cities. And 
Yeah, um, I've you know really just shared a few of the highlights um, from our survey and, and teased uh, some of this this new Persh work. But if you are interested in reading more, um, you could check out the preprint uh, for our forthcoming paper specifically on these survey results. And there's a lot more in there. Um, it'll be published in the Journal of American Planning Association, but you can uh, you can read it now on ResearchGate um, using the URL here on the link or on the slide. So uh, with that, I will stop now and uh, turn it back over to Lad uh, to kick off our panel discussion. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. And we really thought it was important to kind of um, lay out the picture of what's happening across the United States again in those large cities, the smaller and rural communities as well. But I'm excited for the next portion of this webinar because we have um, representatives from three of the cities that face different types of heat risk, but have also really charted the way for um, you know, the United States with how cities can address heat risk. And so um, first up, we have uh, Kizzy Charles Guzman, who is the Deputy Director for the New York City Mayor's Office of Climate and Sustainability. She'll be followed by Mark Hartman, Chief uh, Sustainability Officer at the City of Phoenix, and then uh, Jane Gilbert, the Chief Heat Officer at Miami-Dade County. So uh, based on this order, Kizzy, let's start off with you. And you may have to unmute because it, there you Sorry. go. Yes, I was muted. Um, now I'm fine. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. And 91 of you on the on the line, and so thanks for making time. Um, again, my name is Casey Charles Guzman from the New York City Mayor's Office of Climate and Sustainability. And of course, in New York City, like in the rest of the country, extreme heat is a present danger, not a future risk only. Um, hurricanes and coastal storms they they get a lot more coverage, and their effects are more visible. But we are already enduring heat waves that are more frequent and more intense and longer in duration. Indoor temperatures here can be up to 20 degrees higher than outdoor temperatures without air conditioner. And some neighborhoods are much warmer than others due to inequities in green infrastructure and vegetation, the presence of dark impervious surfaces, and many sources of waste heat like traffic, infrastructure, and industrial uses. So as a result, on a heat wave day, New York City sees an average of 110 direct and indirect heat-related deaths every year. And when you consider the entire warm season, so from May through September, that number jumps to 350 deaths annually. And we see that the great majority of those effects are experienced by our seniors, mostly African-American men baking in their apartments without access to cooling or fearful of a high energy bill in substandard housing. Most of the people who died here were exposed to heat at home rather than outdoors or in a hospital or institutional setting, unlike what Lad was sharing earlier. Um, and each of these deaths was preventable, right? Um, on top of that, the New York City Panel on Climate Change is projecting that by the 2050s, the number of days in New York City above 90 degrees will triple. And we're in the Northeast, so that is a little warm for us. So our heat interventions can be described in two ways. First, there is how the city of New York activates a heat emergency response plans when the National Weather Service issues heat wave and extreme heat advisories. So think of this as the heat management side that Sarah and, and Lado were just mentioning. In those instances, which occur many times per summer, responding to a heat emergency and helping New Yorkers stay cool is a multi-agency effort that involves opening cooling centers, extending the hours of our water features and recreational facilities, and also, of course, emergency health mess messaging and communication to the public via local community groups and health services providers. So in those instances, we're coordinated by our emergency management department and our parks and health departments, our department for the aging and our public housing are some of the most active agencies in that emergency response. But separately, there's the climate adaptation planning side. And for that, we're also collaborating across agencies, but we're guided by mayoral offices, such as my office, and also the Office of Climate Resiliency, right? Because we see that heat threatens our livability, but especially with vulnerable New Yorkers, we had the impetus to develop a heat adaptation plan that had health and racial equity at its core, specifically to reduce disparities and vulnerability to climate change. And we released this plan in 2017 and we called it Cool Neighborhoods New York City. The plan is to make communities cooler through significant tree planting in city streets and parks in historically underinvested communities and painting reflective coatings on millions of square feet of rooftops in some of our most 
heat vulnerable neighborhoods to achieve clusters um, of light color surfaces. We also provided heat risk education and increased social support networks through our Be a Buddy program and enlisted home care agencies and community health organizations as partners in building heat resiliency so we can protect those that are most vulnerable. So we do have a separate and specific plan, and that was a significant investment and realignment of our existing spending into high-risk areas. The idea is that environmental amenities, like ensuring access to cooling, are a lifeline and not a luxury reserved for high-income neighborhoods. In the interest of time, I'm only going to touch on a few other initiatives that I'm also very proud of. One is that we enacted legislation requiring all new buildings and those undergoing major roof renovations to be covered by solar panels, green roofs, or some combination of the two. Two, last year, as the summer season was approaching and the COVID-19 crisis and the climate crisis were coming head to head, um, we knew that they could interact in ways that may cause additional deaths, particularly in low-income communities that were already being devastated by the virus. And with the stay-at-home orders and social distancing orders in place, we had more limited access to cool public spaces due to safety concerns. So we knew that facilitating home cooling and providing assistance to those that most needed it was simply a matter of life and death. So we launched a program to provide 74,000 air conditioners to low-income and vulnerable New Yorkers, especially seniors. And this program was administered through our capable and exhausted city agency partners. So again, this effort was designed with equity at its core by focusing on public housing residents and those that are most economically and physically at risk to heat-related illness and death. And lastly, we also focus at the state level, advocating for an expansion of cooling assistance through the Home Energy Assistance Program, which is the program that is federally funded, though it is administered by states and available to most of the cities here, all of the states here. Um, and we submitted a petition to our Public Service Commission, and they approved over $70 million in emergency cooling assistance grants to help low-income New Yorkers cover the cost of their electricity bills. We also successfully petitioned to expand access to the low-income program and to limit utility service terminations. All that to say, access to air conditioning is a climate equity issue, and cooling our neighborhoods is the way that we want to achieve environmental justice. And it takes coordination of many, many agencies and partners to be able to do that. So we've been focused on that since 2015. Um, and I'm really, really proud uh, to have been part of the team that has been really bringing heat emergency uh, from like round circle in, in, in that series of strategies that Sarah and Lad just mentioned uh, to you guys. So I'll pass it over. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you so much, Kizzy. And next up, we have uh, Mark Hartman again with the City of Phoenix. And um, just a reminder, the City of Phoenix was uh, the first city in the country to have a publicly funded Office of Heat Mitigation and Response. So, Mark, it, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, hey, thanks, Lad and Sarah and Kizzy, another so so far. And it's great to be here today, just kind of talking about it and. It's so good, you know, being from Phoenix to finally get some attention on heat. It's kind of like a silent storm. It just doesn't get the, you know, the press of the hurricanes and the tornadoes. But, you know, it really is, a, a, you know, certainly more weather related of all the weather related disasters. Heat is definitely, uh, you know, a, a significant for heat related deaths more than any other uh, weather related disaster. And, you know, I think the, you know, in a way, you know, just a bit of context, like for Phoenix, it's been, you know, we were in a desert and people identify it's part of our DNA here that people do recognize that, you know, as they understand that a lot of our businesses and our processes are, are very much adapted to that. It's, it's a part of who we are. Uh, and so, you know, we see things like our, we have a walkable urban code that requires uh, for all our high growth areas where it requires 75% shade around new developments. And for, you know, we have since 2006 have had a pretty robust heat relief network that does, you know, hydration stations and cooling centers and outreach and, you know, wellness checks on elderly and others, vulnerable populations to uh, ensure they're fine. It's like 139 participating organizations. So, so we do some things really well, a whole potpourri of actions that we've done. And, uh, but still uh, recognizing, you know, heat doesn't affect us all the same and the vulnerable populations really have um, you know, suffered more so, uh, particularly, you know, a lot of our low-income neighborhoods have 
you know, the most limited tree canopy of anywhere in the city. And they're also the hottest areas, you know, when we look at surface temperature maps. And some neighborhoods, um, you know, have, with a high percentage of low income actually have, you know, an 80% zero car households are really dependent on taking transit and walking through some of those really hot streets. And so, uh, you know, our, our efforts now have really focused and catalyzed in the last few years of really focusing and emphasizing on vulnerable populations and vulnerable communities and vulnerable neighborhoods. And so, you know, and as we're even seeing now, you know, certainly it's impacted, but, you know, as, as um, Kiz was mentioning that, you know, the forecast from the National Weather Service are it's even going to get hotter in Phoenix, which is hard to imagine, or uh, in longer duration of summers. And so we really need to be prepared and thinking about that. And so that's where, you know, this concept of a heat office that isn't really to just take all responsibility for heat, but actually can really help departments coordinate and implementing, you know, broad sweeping actions across all departments, because it really would require actions of those and all the stakeholders and partners uh, to do things. And so, you know, things like you know, really leading the way on kind of cool pavement. Now, Phoenix is more cool pavement than any other city in the world. Uh, we're certainly really seeing some early success at that, that there's actually really potential for that. And for uh, one thing that's really important, and I see as a real signature in Phoenix is the cool corridors, uh, looking to build a network of cool corridors. Because we just don't have the humidity here, we can, if you, as long as you're in the shade, you're doing pretty well. <laughs> it's uh, as long as you get away from that radiant heat of the giant uh, fire in the sky, um, you know, you can very much uh, navigate through the city. You know, when we actually ask residents, there's a shaded pathway from where you live to nearby stores, would you walk more often than you do now? And so, uh, you know, and 85% said, yes, absolutely, they do that. And so really recognizing the importance of, of and I almost wonder if some of these actions are, you know, it's not just about heat and protecting citizens, but also getting people out in the community and walking more, certainly the health related outcomes, but building social cohesion, uh, you know, in, in a context, I think, I, I wonder if that's actually a greater benefit of actually connecting, increasing connection with others as we provide these solutions. And so that's kind of the overall. And I think one other thing I wanted to mention that's kind of the, the most interesting and intriguing of all is some of the research, I mean, we have ASU close to us, that's the you know epicenter of research related to heat. And they've been doing some really innovative things around looking at some like evaluating radiative cooling film and other types of materials that could really, you know, help in sort of uh, providing really practical solutions that kind of have it on some of our bus shelters uh, to look at as it converts to long wave radiation, the underside of that can be 20 degrees cooler of that surface. So really interesting to see where some of these zoom technologies and a catalyst. And so that's where we look forward to our new heat office that's bringing on to look at heat in general, as well as trees and materials. We'll all be kind of leading the way on that and uh, helping departments uh, kind of implement a lot of those solutions. So that's kind of the run through. And actually I've got one more thing I wanted to mention. Uh, really interesting of you. I don't know if you've seen some of the rating of cities around environmental and social governance, but uh, in ESG goals that that rating agencies like Moody's and S&P and others are looking at cities for their adaptation ability and looking at what kind of actions they are preparing for the future. And if it affects a credit rating of a city, now you've got the interest of your finance department. Very interested. <laughs> I want to hear more about this. And uh, we've certainly heard that. Uh, we've actually had uh, letters from Moody saying, hey, look, here's how your ratings and here we look at uh, how the city's doing. And, and it was nice to get some attention uh, from our finance department to say, hey, they really like this stuff you're doing. Keep doing it. Uh, because, you know, uh, you think of even a 0.1 interest in, um, in credit rating uh, as far as your credit score effects on kind of your bond issues that happen to the city, that could be tens of millions of dollars in impact. And they're rightly so in recognizing that cities really need to be increased their resilience. And so those ESG scores are really, I think that's an important way uh, to look at if we want to really connect and engage uh, departments citywide, uh, right from the city manager's attention on down, I think the recognizing that, hey, credit rating agencies are really looking at the ESG scores of your city and your adaptation and how you actually are ready for a future that's going to be perhaps a little bit hotter and uh, a lot, a lot um, longer summers and those types of things. So yeah, those were my introductory remarks. I got lots to talk about, but no, so thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, lad. 
Great, thank you so much, Mark. Um, and next up, we have Jane Gilbert, who really blazed some trails as the City of Miami's Chief Resilience Officer and who is now um, the world's first uh, Chief Heat Officer. So Jane, if you wanna join us. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Lad. And wow, I just learned so much from you and Sarah and Kizzy and Mark. It's really a pleasure to um, be on this panel today and to learn from each of you. Uh, can Am I doing the right thing to share my screen? Can people see it? Yes, it looks good. Great. So um, just to share a little bit about Miami first, uh, just for context, you know, Lad talked about chronic heat versus extreme. Uh, Miami-Dade County, we've known heat for a long time, like Phoenix, and and we're just experiencing more of it. So we are generally well prepared and adapted to heat, but we are not adapted to the level of increases we're already experiencing and will experience in the future. Um, we have, uh, in, in, in Miami, because it's a, a tr tropical climate, we, heat index is very important, not just temperature, because we have uh, humidity in the summer months at 65, 70% on average. So we're, we're historically had about seven days a, a year of heat indexes at or above 105 when really we're all even if you're adapted to Miami's heat we're all vulnerable to heat illnesses and heat impacts and by mid-century we're looking at close to three months of that um, and while we do have very high AC penetration in Miami when we have a widespread an extended power outage, say from a hurricane or something else, we are extremely vulnerable. Hurricanes typically happen in the warmer months. And uh, in 2017, we had Hurricane Irma that did result in widespread power outages and we lost 12 people in the county just north of us. Since then, we've put in some regulations to require all nursing homes and assisted living facilities to have backup power. Uh, with enough fuel to, in capacity to keep uh, community space cool. We have many more facilities in public housing and our emergency shelters to make sure we have that cooling capacity in the event of a widespread power outage. Um, we just updated our urban tree canopy assessment. This is a Miami-Dade County is made up of 34 municipalities. So those uh, on the left are our municipalities and the percent of tree canopy overall, we're at about 20%, but you can see there's a real wide variety in that. On the, on the right is an image from a very green area from Coral Gables in this area. And on the left is part of downtown Miami and over on, the right, on the bottom is part of Overtown. So you can see, and that lines up with some of those social vulnerability indices like household income, where uh, this is more by census block area, but uh, you can see it pretty much parallels on the left here is household income and, and on the right is urban tree canopy uh, percents. Our goal is to get to 30%, but in the last five years, we've remained flat even with very extensive tree planting efforts. Why? One, we lost a lot of trees in Hurricane Irma, and two, we have ongoing growth and development in our area. And it was really out of uh, growing concern in the community about urban heat and, and heat illnesses, as well as our partnership with the Adrian Arch Rockefeller Foundation that the idea of a chief heat officer was born um, really understanding that while we have had actions to address heat, whether it's tree planting or through emergency management, setting up cooling centers and warning systems, et cetera, they aren't coordinated and they needed to be accelerated given the acceleration of, of the problem. And uh, in terms of governance, it was very refreshing to hear 
LAD's concept of governance because we are creating our plans for heat action under the Resilient 305 framework, which was a strategy we developed and was released in, in uh, 26, no, 2019. Um, and uh, that is a collaboration between the county, the city of Miami, city of Miami Beach, and our place-based foundation, the Miami Foundation. So it is a strategy that includes actions from various agencies, our university partners, our community-based partners, as well as from the municipalities and the county. And then uh, I was appointed by the mayor of the Miami-Dade County, so I work very closely with the Miami-Dade County's Office of Resilience and their Chief Resilience Officer and their team integrating extreme heat into their mitigation adaptation and other plans. And these are some of them. The Resilient 305 the, uh, was, as I mentioned, released in 2019, the sea level rise strategy in January of this year. And we just released the final climate action strategy yesterday. Uh, so heat is very integrated in that because I was on the team as it was being developed. Um, but even with the sea level rise strategy, as we address certain adaptation action areas, heat will be addressed as part of that. And as 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 Lad mentioned, collaboration is key, both with regional groups as well as some of our global partners with resilient city networks the extreme heat resilience alliance and the global cool cities i uh in next month we will be launching our climate and heat health task force to create a plan of short-term actions that it that really aims to coordinate and accelerate work that's already underway as well as identify new actions um, so i look forward to Lad and Sarah's framework for considering integrating heat in all the plans because I, I will be reading that carefully and um, taking note as we create our plan and uh, recommend staffing and monitoring, et cetera. It is a diverse task force of members from the National Weather Service, our Department of Health, our our municipalities, our community-based organizations, and our universities, as well as <clears throat> we're uh, currently accepting applications for to community members who uh, have the lived experience of heat vulnerability. We, as a foundation of that planning over this summer, created a climate and heat health toolkit that just is a sort of inventory of what's underway and some recommended quicker you know first year we're, we're we're driving the train as we're building it so what can we do in this year while we're also undergoing a, a larger planning process um so that's out and it, it's structured under environmental type initiatives building and transit and communications engagement and preparedness type uh initiatives we did a big outreach campaign this summer around uh heat awareness through social media, through posters, through this resilience pod, which we're, we're uh, doing in partnership with the Arshrock Center. Did a series of posters in our public spaces in multiple languages. And we did uh, some education through our summer camps and, and learned from the kids about what they're doing in response. Um, working with our emergency management on <clears throat> enhancing our community emergency response team trainings to have a little more on heat and to expand those teams in general. Um, and then we are, in terms of plan integration, our local hazard mitigation strategy currently does not identify extreme heat as a priority uh, risk. And so that is one thing we're doing the research now to make sure that we can incorporate extreme heat into that strategy. Um, and one of those things, as I mentioned earlier, is to make sure our evacuation shelters have the backup power capacity to keep these shelters cool in the event of a widespread power outage. Um, and some of that, ideally, what we want to do is solutions 
that don't <clears throat> add to our greenhouse gas emissions. So we're looking to uh, for opportunities to invest in solar on these generally school facilities that serve as shelters. We're also working with our outdoor worker community and um, our parks will be on the, our parks department will be on the team with their tree planting efforts. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Lad to start and stop sharing this, um, but I really thank you and look forward to our discussion. Great, thank you so much, Jane. And Mark and Kizzy, if you want to cam on and rejoin us. So we uh, received plenty of questions um, when people registered. And so I'll start with some of those and continue to uh, place your questions in the question box and I'll try to monitor those as well. Um, so one of, the, one of the questions I thought would be interesting to kick off the panel discussion with is what um, do your municipalities uh, see as the advantages or disadvantages of having that dedicated role of a chief heat officer or a heat office? Or Kizzy, let's start with you. In your case, New York City has integrated heat across many departments. And so kind of what's the, it does for the audience to kind of hear the thought process behind that and the advantages and disadvantages of those dedicated roles versus kind of an integrated approach? Sure, sure. Uh, to be clear, we do not have a heat planning office per se, right? Like the heat adaptation plan was developed under the auspice of the mayor's office of climate resiliency. Um, and it was absolutely an interagency collaboration. Uh, there was a working group uh, that was made up of city agencies and academics and some nonprofits that helped us inform uh, the development of that first strategy, right? Um, I, I do think that having a dedicated office is advantageous to me, Somebody has to wake up in the morning and their job is to think about this issue, right? Um, the fact of the matter is that most climate offices, most resiliency offices, most sustainability teams are focused on different issues, uh, flooding risk, extreme weather events that aren't heat. And that's because heat is, as you mentioned earlier, often considered a chronic nuisance as opposed to what it is, which is a public health and a climate emergency, right? Like it's, it's, it's something that is really affecting our community especially our most vulnerable populations. So I think also, I'll just say that there is a perception that we can plant trees as our silver bullet for extreme heat resilience. And the bottom line is that this isn't true. It takes a hundred years <laughs> to get a hundred year old tree um, that can really give us the benefits of shading and, and evapotranspiration and all those wonderful things. So like the, the mitigation things that we tend to see on the sustainability side and even the resiliency side, often are kind of um, not enough unless you have a heat officer whose job is, in their perception, their job is to save lives, right? So you can ask me more about this in q and if you're more curious. Um, I still think that there are many government agencies that see the solutions to thermal safety as a luxury, as opposed to as a human right, and as opposed to as a climate equity issue. So I'm so inspired to see that there are um, the states and, and, and you know Jane is on board, and then we're thinking really about how we can change that mentality, as, especially as we're facing greater risks, right? I think a heat office is a place where that can, thinking can be incubated. A disadvantage is that many such offices can become very quickly siloed. So if a city gets to say, look, we now have a city, a heat officer, um, but depending on where they put this person and who's actually signing their paycheck, there's, there's a potential there for a lack of convening or policy making power. So those are some of the pros and cons that I see. I think that having that time for relationship development and building is so important, and yet we are kind of racing against the clock. I just wanna say one more thing, which is that, you know, um, regardless of where this thinking takes place, to me, the most important thing um, is that the chief heat office has to be closely working and aligned with the health department. So for one, the health department is the agency that is best positioned in any city to conduct surveillance of heat related illnesses and deaths. You need that data in order to make better cases to your budget offices to actually fund the work and the interventions and the strategies and to provide a sense of urgency. The health department is who helps you understand who's most at risk. They make recommendations and implement uh, prevention measures, right? 
they're frankly also our most trusted messengers, both to the public and certainly across government stakeholders. So it just hits different when, when you have the health department behind you. Um, and I'll give an example of that. So after the 2006 heat waves in New York City, it was our health department that examined the relationship between heat index and excess mortality. So some of the data, Keith, you mentioned earlier, and Sarah, um, they found that that increase at a lower heat index value than the threshold that we had for heat advisories, what was being used at that, that time. They knew that heat illness could also happen at even lower temperatures, especially for people with pre-existing or health conditions that made it more at risk to heat. So in 2008, they're the ones that work with the local National Weather Service and the Emergency Management Department to lower the National Weather Service heat advisory criteria for New York City. And with that revised criteria, we now issue that heat advisory anytime that the heat index forecast is to reach 100 degrees for any duration of time or 95 degrees for two days in a row. So Listen, that means that we do activate the heat emergency plan that I mentioned earlier a lot more often, but we do that and we're able to keep more people safe, right? Um, and it has been our health department that teamed up with researchers at Columbia University to look at neighborhood level factors that were associated with risk of death during heat waves. And again, it was that study that developed a heat vulnerability index for our city, which to this day is the primary tool that my office uses to assess neighborhoods that are more vulnerable to heat and are in need and the sustainability interventions and investments. So anyways, the heat offers a role is to save lives and you can see how a partnership with their health department is critical to cement from the outset, like from a policy perspective. Great, thank you so much, Kizzy. Mark, why don't you go next and kind of talk through the rationale for Phoenix creating its uh, heat office and you know some of the advantages and maybe potential disadvantages that you're encountering? Well, oh, certainly, yeah, thank you. And, uh, the, you know, I'm really glad that Phoenix, uh, we put in our budget for a heat officer before the article came out recommending that the cities have a heat officer. So we kind of preempted that. That was good. Uh, and, you know, it was really, we did have, you know, within sustainability, a lot of the oversight or not oversight, but just kind of support for how to catalyze all the action related to heat. It was departments implementing them. But, uh, you know, and we worked closely with ASU, uh, and particularly, you know, many of many different faculties, but uh, the Dr. David Hanula was kind of a center of a lot of those things. And I was so glad when he actually joined our city and is, is our new uh, director of our heat, uh, uh, heat office. So that's really great to have such a expert kind of joining the city. So it also meant I had a lot less to sort of, he's actually hit the ground running. So that's really good. And, you know, as far as, you know, there's so much that isn't done by, wouldn't naturally be done or no department would be responsible for to really look at overall heat management and looking at what are all the actions. And um, one of the things that we're really excited about is really to evaluate and kind of look at all the areas of policies, programs, and governance of the city to see if we're truly heat ready. And this evaluation, you know, 2,200 cities in the U.S. are storm ready and have gone through that evaluation of emergency management. But this heat ready concept is a new one that we're kind of pioneering here in Arizona, um, kind of led by SU to sort of look at what are, how are we doing and what are the, what are, what are the forms of governance we have? And I think having a heat office would be one of the things we get points for, I'm sure, within heat readiness, uh, that um, it's really, it's so important to see. And I think particularly things like outreach and partnerships with, with industry and things that no department was naturally doing that. But so having this heat office, it's a catalyst uh, to really see action citywide and report on progress and really prepare our city, I think is really paramount. So yeah, no, I think, I think it's a great solution for all cities. Great, thank you, Mark. And Jane is the world's first chief heat officer. What have you encountered so far? And what have been some of the things that have happened with your position? And I've, Sure, you've heard from other communities kind of interested in how uh, Miami-Dade County is structuring things too. Absolutely, and certainly as formerly a chief resilience officer and working within a county with a chief resilience officer, there's been a lot of questions about that relationship as well. And, and the good thing is, is that Jim Murley, who serves as the county's chief resilience officer, is someone that I've worked with for many years in my previous roles. And so we work very closely together and I work with his team because, you know, this is part of his adaptation portfolio, really, in many ways. And like a chief resilience officer, we really are 
charged with being silo busters. We are charged with the idea of working across departments and across uh, agencies and with, with external partners to, to address these increases in shocks and stresses. So, so heat is one in particular. And, you know, Miami's known internationally for its vulnerability to sea level rise and flooding, but it really hadn't heat was just starting to bubble up and it needed the level of um, the mayor wanted to send the message this is equally important and needs that focus and so i think um, without that level of collaboration within the office of resilience is both resilience and sustainability so similar to mark's office in that sense um, and so without that strong collaboration I, I don't think it could work. Um, and I think it's going to be, uh, you know, I, I, interesting where Miami-Dade County goes with this in the long run, because right now I'm a contracted position through the Miami Foundation under our Resilient 305 initiative. Certainly many of the actions will be within the county and I'm working very closely internally with the county. And the goal is to have a permanent position uh, in the long run. But, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how we come up with the governance structure in the long run for that. Great. Thank you, Jane. We've received a couple of questions with the registration forms, and then I'm also going to consolidate a few questions we've gotten in the chat box, um, kind of about the difficulty of framing heat as a risk and communicating that to the public, but then also how do you engage grassroots organizations and community organizations specifically around heat risk and kind of advancing efforts? So, can leave that one open. Well, I'll... Jane, do you want to go? I'll start with my short uh, tenure so far uh, in this role, but um, the lucky thing with us is that there was a coalition of community-based organizations that had been doing outreach over the last year on um, climate and health equity, uh, finding, doing a series of focus groups and surveys in our most vulnerable communities uh, socioeconomically to find out what their top concerns were related to climate change. And heat and displacement were the top two concerns. So together, that coalition of community-based organizations and our university partners created a policy platform that they want to move forward on heat. And are already, we have you know one that's focused on outdoor workers, one that's focused on clinicians in the healthcare sector, one that's focused on just broadly the the social vulnerable communities, and so, and one that's on housing issues. So I feel like I have very strong partners there, as well as with our university partners. Um, what, what we're working towards over this summer is also with our National Weather Service. At, at our, like Mark mentioned in Phoenix, most of our hospitalizations happen below our advisory and warning levels. Our advisory and warning levels are, and it's great to hear your story, Kizzy, about your partnership with the health department to get yours lowered because ours are currently at a heat, an advisory at a heat index of 108 and a warning at a heat index of 113, which is very high. And we don't get those levels usually. Um, so it's really, we get a lot at in the 103 to 105, range and that's really when we we start to see a lot of uptick of of hospitalization so so anyway we're working with them on the national weather service on messaging and our emergency management can't activate cooling centers unless they get an advisory or a warning so it's really important that we get those lowered um we're working with the you know, healthcare sector on a on an outreach campaign for for messaging around heat as well. I'm hoping that through this vulnerability analysis that we're doing, it, we will be better targeted in our next heat season campaign in terms of how you know what what are the media outlets that different mo our most vulnerable populations 
listen to, attend to, who do they talk to, how do we get that message out and really reach those that are, are truly most vulnerable. So to be more uh, driven by those, that information in the next heat season. Yeah, I think that access to vulnerable, you know, in many ways, cities have, you know, just by ease and things not really focused so much on the voices they hear aren't necessarily the vulnerable communities. Those aren't the ones who's, and it's really important for cities to be thinking about, okay, whose voices are not, are we not hearing? And, uh, you know, in, in regard to vulnerable populations, I mean, it's interesting, even as, you know, them even wanting to interact with the city, there's even less openness to oak in the city, help them well, you know, when we work with some of the nonprofits in the community and community uh, partners, that, you know, the level of trust and all those things, so really having to build some of that in order to be an effective response. And even when we say, oh, we have a great cooling center, but do they go, do they want to use that cooling center and how, what would make them want to use it? You know, we say, okay, well, we have a whole community here and there's five people in our cooling center. Why isn't anyone else here? You know, and so having those conversations where we can build social norms around that and uh, build social norms around how to, you know, even, uh, even maybe um, uh, PSDs, personal shade devices, maybe we should make those fashionable where people can hold up, uh, start where people can actually be applauded for having an umbrella, you know, in the heat. You know, it's certainly done in China, but it's just not like, what are you wearing an umbrella for? Are you crazy? Um, so, you know, I think those kind of things of really how to work with the community to build their own personal resilience and understand what, what would actually make them attractive for them to kind of take advantage of these services where we can really use, and I think there's an opportunity, um, cities have historically not had great relationships, well, now's an opportunity to actually build those relationships. This is a great topic to engage them and partner and build those relationships on. So use this as the place, the entry into the communities to finally have those necessary conversations. Hey, Kizzy, do you have anything from your end? Sure, I, I, um, I'm really, these messages are resonating so much as I hear you guys uh, describing your experience. We, we also have, um, I mentioned that we, we launched a, a, a pilot program called Be A Buddy. And partly is that we wanted to make sure, like we already had in the in emergency management world, we already had um, what we call our, our community emergency response teams, which are members of the community, they volunteer, um, to step in and, and take and take care of their neighbors during big emergencies, but things like a tornado. So they are the ones that get activated and they run out and help to chop down the tree branches that may be on, on the street and things like that, or, or help with shoveling snow if we're having a, a big snowstorm. But we don't tend to activate them as the city of New York, the emergency management didn't tend to activate them during uh, heat emergency days, specifically because it felt like that would be all the time, right? Like that would be a nuisance. And we thought that that was a, a, a mistake, you right? Like that was um, a, a failure of, of, of us because to me, um, it's almost like you, ha you have a muscle and you have to work that out, right? And so we knew that communities sometimes don't wanna hear from the bureaucrats. They are not listening to us uh, during the extreme heat day, we weren't showing them the right messages in the media, right? Like we were saying, hey, a heat wave is coming, make sure that you stay protected, but we're showing them images on, the, on TV that is young people running outside jogging or uh, young people on playing in a fire hydrant or at a beach. So seniors weren't seeing themselves represented on TV and they were getting this idea that the risk was outdoors as opposed to the risk was indoors, right? So we decided to actually just launch this pilot called Be A Buddy. And it was about uh, identifying community residents that had knowledge of who lived in their buildings that was potentially socially isolated or that would be a, a more trusted messenger. And the way that we did that was we actually decided to fund community organizations that had those deep roots in the communities that we that our index had were heat vulnerable. So we just started with three organizations and three large geographies, and they developed these volunteer networks and these buddy systems, and they trained them on emergency and, and, and kind of heat related, uh, heat health uh, um, uh, tips and, and how to identify those risks um, and so on. And again, it's the idea that a senior or a, a socially isolated New Yorker is more likely to take advice and, and seek help from a neighbor or someone connected to an organization that they trust um, versus just listening to our health commissioner issue a warning. Um, so anyways, I think that the, the partnerships with local community organizations are super important, but 
to that point, we, we do have to figure out ways to to throw them some funding. They, they need the support in order to be able to have the organizers to to yeah. do that kind of outreach. No, I really like that, Kizzy. The funding is really important. It, it's, you know, and I think the thing, the point you're getting at was really that in order to be a resilient community, you need to build that muscle memory. And so you need to actually have them get out and do that so they actually think about it. So even when they're not getting a notification, they may go, hey, you know, I should just go do a check on them anyway. And so, you know, we have a lot of cities have the structure like on things like Block Watch. Well, you know, we have a heat watch and maybe are some of the same people who kind of do that when they do their rounds for block watch, they also do some check-ins or, so there's lots of ways to kind of engage that. But no, I think it's really important to have people take on their personal responsibility for, for their community uh, and build that sense of, hey, a community where people do who know, know who their neighbors are. And, you know, when people do, it builds a happiness index because they have a sense of place in their community. And so, really many benefits to kind of building that personal resilience within neighborhoods. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. That's a great, great conversation there. So I'm going to ask you to kind of flip your perspective and look upwards. And so consolidate a few different questions that we have here. What could states and the federal government do better to support cities um, with uh, planning and addressing heat? And a couple of folks in the chat have mentioned uh, the Biden White House has climate-focused interagency work groups that are kind of looking for executive actions that may be taken. Um, and then we also have a note about, of course, the OSHA laws, um, where they're drafting up the nation's potential first heat safety regulations. And obviously those come at higher levels of governance, but what could states and the federal government do better to support cities with um, heat efforts? I think it's something right away. And uh, I'll, I'll be first, because we're probably all thinking of it anyway, but the you know one of the things that you know as uh, i think we've all kind of mentioned is that he was kind of considered a luxury or some i mean sorry cooling is considered a luxury and that uh for somebody to have cooling and you know it's not necessarily so even in fema funding you know they actually provide in you know in light heat they actually give more funding for heating you know assistance rather than cooling assistance and so for a city like phoenix where it's all cooling <laughs> And it's just the flip side, like people say, well, you know, do you really need, you know, you're just using cooling all the time. Well, a lot of cities are using heating all the time in the winter, you know, so it really is no different. And so uh, it's just kind of the inverse. And so really providing, I think from a federal to align those to, to recognize, hey, heating, cooling, those are all energy related and it does need, they need assistance on both sides of that, that thermostat, you know, so I think that's important. Great. Thank you so much for mentioning that, Mark. Uh, that, that's always my number one thing. I feel like a way that federal agencies can really think through this is there they, there have got to be changes and clarifications uh, made to the low income home energy assistance program. Again, it is a federal program that funding it has to be reallocated every year. It comes to states and states have a lot of discretion in the rules for that plan right and so if there were if there were better standards for for example making uh, cooling assistance an integral part of those state action plans right then you wouldn't have states including mine that make cooling assistance like the the, the stepchild of home heating oil uh, assistance programs right and so i think it, we have so many rules in the state of new york that are completely regressive we uh, you know related to the heat um the heat program uh, we definitely don't like uh residents of public housing are not eligible or those that receive uh federal housing vouchers are not eligible to apply uh it can only be uh, used the, the assistance can only be used for the purchase of the air conditioner but never for the electricity bill and different states do and do it differently so i think that if some of those standards came from the federal government it's as part of that then that would be really um really helpful i would also say one more thing which is that it i think we need to really start to think about decarbonization and paying for decarbonization of our building stock not just through our um uh, utility uh, rates, uh, which is the current model that we have, but rather through our tax base. And I think that's critical. So to me, federal initiatives like President Biden's proposed clean energy standard, uh, it, it comes in, right? Because it would pay for decarbonization through our taxes, which are structured progressively rather than through our utility bills, which are disproportionately higher for low-income families compared to the rest of their income, right? Um, and then the very last plug I'll put in is to me, there should be 
um, indoor te maximum temperature standards and requirements. And of course, as, as, as Jane mentioned, requiring those emergency power systems to actually connect to building cooling systems. So we don't have a repeat of that case in, in Florida where, where all those elderly residents lost their lives. Um, you know, so anyways, I think that there's a lot that the federal government can do, but I'll give Jane a chance and you can come back to me. Uh, Jane, you know, go ahead. I, oh, I'll just build on what, you know, I agree with the lie heap, but I would also add the weatherization program could add air conditioning as a, as a, as a key piece, efficient air conditioning. We need, we need, and, energy efficiency more broadly. I just think we need to think more holistically about housing retrofit and what is safe housing, safe Absolutely. and efficient housing. And, and so, so I think that program also has opportunities. I think with all the infrastructure investments, particularly related to right roads and transportation, we should be encouraging multimodal transit, which in, means that it has to be shaded appropriately and et cetera. And then finally, certainly encourage um, people on this webinar to take a look at the rulemaking that the that OSHA just came out with and, and provide comments on it. We're looking to get some support locally to how do you how do you engage employers and, and employees who are vulnerable on this information so that they can activate it. And 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 so I think at the local level, we need that kind of support. Yeah, that's great. And I think all of you touched on it, but Mark, I just think about the state of Arizona has, you know, the Corporation Commission has certain rules about moratoriums for shutoffs during our hottest times of the year. And, you know, at the city yes. of Phoenix and city of Tucson, we do have those temperature maximums that landlords must provide cooling to make sure that their um, tenants are, you know, appropriately cooled and there's recourses for that. So, yeah, you know, that's a new thing for many states, but that's something that Arizona has been doing for quite a while. Yeah, we just got that with our our, our investor-owned utility with their rate case negotiation to uh, agree to that. Yeah, that's great. And I think we, we talked a lot about the federal government and cities, and a lot of times we forget the important role that states kind of play in that governance structure for you too. So um, another question that we have is, uh, let's see. So kind of a, a broader question, what advice would you give for a community that's just starting to think about heat? Like where, you know, if we have uh, government staff, city staff kind of attending this webinar, where should they start? Who should they uh, bring to the table? And I think you've given um, some of the stakeholders right now, but who else should come to the table and where would you begin? Or where would you advise the city that's just thinking about this to start at? I can kick us off if you'd like. Um, you know, to me, number one, it, don't reinvent the wheel. I think there has been such an increase in awareness about heat risk, but also heat resiliency strategies in the last few years. And I and there's a lot of material online that already like there are guides of here are the top ten policies that together will get us uh, closer to 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 heat resiliency, but also. Um, now, more recently, we're thinking about thermal equity, right, and, 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 and thermal safety. So I think that there are some plans that we can make available, we can share via the chat. If you Google Cool Neighborhoods NYC, you, that should come up, um, although it might also come up which neighbors we think are cool in New York City. Um, so, you know, just, there are some places to start there. But then secondly, I think that for us, um, again, if, if you are that city that is now starting, start with your health department and your parks department. You know what I mean? Like you, you need to identify the agencies that um, may have the data, that have, that have the data that help you make a case for whether the issue is a public health tragedy in your area. And the reason for that is that one death is a tragedy and it's a tragedy because it was preventable very much unlike many of the other random things, right? But uh, when we talk about cooling, you know, people often think about, you know, an air conditioner to 60 degrees and everybody shivering, but no, we actually are talking about setting an AC to 78 degrees and that is a comfortable temperature to keep you alive. And so the, the fact that, that that wasn't available to even one person, right? Um, that, that means that, that that is a policy failure. And so I think the helping to document a, your, your syndromic surveillance during high uh, hot weather days and, and, and your, um, your 
uh, heat illness and, and, and heat death information that feels really important and then try to correlate that information with what your, your tree planting how your, your, your canopy cover in your city and things like that. So that's where I would start. Some of the academics may help you with this analysis. Yeah, there's certainly some good data as well as even looking like for Phoenix, I think it's like 2,500 hospital visits for heat related illness. And you think, okay, what is the cost of those hospital visits to our system? You know, it's just like, it's huge. Uh, like what, you know, in the millions of dollars. And so what could be prevented? And I, I just got a great anecdote that you could point to, to show how short sighted uh, we need, we shouldn't be. Um, so Washington state in 2020, it was a big move by the development community to, um, to sort of remove some of the heat related stuff within the building code. They said, look, we're not the South. We don't really need this stuff. Like, let's just remove this. We'll save all kinds of money. It'll help with housing affordability and stuff. And it was, it's actually looking like it was great, making great progress and gonna go ahead. And they kind of send the alerts out to the heat community, like Global Cool Cities Alliance and others all rushed there and said, are you crazy? <laughs> it's gonna get hot. Like you guys better watch out. And that was in 2020 when those were really at risk of being pulled out of the building code. Then this year in June, they just had the hottest year, hottest year on record of history by far, you know, with temperatures, the huge number, as you pointed out the, on the onset lad of what happened. And you just think, hey, don't be, don't be like Washington state that was considering removing these. We got to go the other direction and be prepared because when it happens, you want to be on the right side of that. So I think there's a really good lesson learned. So. Absolutely. Mark. <laughs> yeah, Jane, do you have any comments? What would you recommend for a city starting out addressing heat? Um, well, I, I think I really like Kizzy's idea of, of making sure you get the data needed to back up your your um, your case. Uh, I'm looking at that right now to build it into our local mitigation strategy and our overall you know response, our communications response, et cetera. I do think, and I agree, there is a lot of great work including what Phoenix and New York have done that I'm building on. You know, there's a lot of great work out there as well as this whole webinar series that's been out that, that is so informative to help people get going. I, I, I think getting an internal small task force that includes emergency management, parks, planning, maybe your public works, um, and, uh, and then, and then, and then also maybe if if it's it's a larger start bringing in your other partners health health department national weather service local weather forecasting office and um, community based partners. Great, that's great advice. So let's uh, let's wrap up with just your final thoughts and um, maybe if there's anything you feel optimistic about to end it kind of on a good note, but kind of an, an optimistic thing that your city's doing or Kind of what you're looking forward to accomplishing in the next year or a couple of years related to heat and then we'll turn it back over um, to our NOAA facilitators so um let's see kizzy do you want to go first and wrap up all right um listen i am uh i am optimistic because i'm hearing jane and mark describe the work that they're doing and honestly it, it is such a change. I've, I've been at this since 2015, and now we have heat offices and, and chief heat officers. And, and, and to me, that is so incredible because so much of this time has been trying to convince uh, a public works department that, you know, asphalt is not the solution to every problem and that every building, you know, should have um, a cool roof or a green roof above and that that is good for the planet and good for our future as well as uh, good for the for the residents that live in that building um so you know i i'm, I'm really encouraged by that because i do see it a tide shifting but to, i also feel a sense of urgency because we can't wait for even more hot days and and um it, it, you know that that are ahead and we know what the impacts of of that inaction will be so i think one one thing i want to leave folks with is that we do need everyone um, and right now, I feel like the sustainability sphere is so focused on decarbonization of buildings and energy and, and transition into electrification. And we just really want to make sure that we are talking about 
compete in that conversation as well, right? And, and, and the energy cost burden of electrifying our places and making sure that we are integrating urban smart surfaces, right? Like that are not retaining and absorbing all this heat um, and, and ensuring that we are switching away from fossil fuels in a way that, again, we, we don't want to continue to contribute to the warming of our cities. And, and, and I think that a lot of the surfaces and the materials that we use just in our regular coasts and our regular building practices really are so unsustainable, right? It's just, it's too much. It traps too much heat and it's, it feels like we are planting trees because we don't actually wanna deal with the amount of asphalt in our communities. And we need to do that, address the root cause, both of inequity, but also the landscape of our cities and the way that we have segregated and divided our environmental amenities. So I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged to see it to be part of this group and oh, I'm so glad to have peers in other, in other cities and states that are doing the good work. Um, so I'll leave it, I'll, I'll leave it there uh, to the audience. Keep our feet to the fire. It is our job as government folks, um, bureaucrats to keep you alive and safe and thriving. And we have to achieve our sustainability goals while we have thriving populations and healthy populations. So keep uh, holding us to the task on that. Great, thank you, Kizzy. Mark, do you want to go next? Sure, yeah. Well, Mother Nature is certainly helping us get the message out uh, of what the importance of the, you know, I think the, the one thing that I, I would say and I've seen so, happen so much is actually as you work with departments and give them success to sort of lead the message that they really can passionately take it forward. Like our streets department, you know, it was initially like, can you please come with me to LA to look at what's happening? You know, well, I guess we could send somebody. And now they're actually, you know, now speaking on webinars uh, all over the globe and just, you know, getting so much attention for some of our cool pavement work and, and other departments, just really recognizing and taking it on. Even our arts department has been creating sort of public art with shade and working with that. And so many people, it's, they're getting great accolades for it. Now they're doing a heat book and stuff. And so departments are leading the way. And I think, if we just give people an opportunity to really use their levels of expertise, they'll really run with it because they, they do see and get feedback on those benefits. And I did want to say the most exciting thing and opportunity though is I actually see uh, in the infrastructure bill and in the reconciliation bill opportunity for home energy retrofits yeah. in particularly low income communities. And so I would love to see like a 30, 40, 50 million dollar program directed at doing some of these to, you know, within cities to do that within each city uh, to really focus on that. Because, you know, in many ways we haven't really, you know, using taxpayer dollars for some of that. It's been kind of relying on other funders. So it really is great to see that injection. And I think we could really move the dial on some of that instead of just doing two or 300 homes a year. We could do it in the thousands. So no, that'd be awesome. Great, thank you, Mark. And Jane, final comments? Well, first, I'm very inspired by both Kizzy and Mark have been working on these issues for quite some time, and, and it's really inspiring to hear, hear both of you. Um, I'm super excited about my role in getting this going. Uh, having a mayor who really wants to see action in a short period of time and really making this a priority is... Uh, is 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 exciting and at the same time our federal government is also on board with its integrated work so i i, I think it's a hopeful time to get things moving we have just a massive amount to do <laughs> but, but, but uh kizzy i'll take your words and give, that'll keep me inspired to keep going <laughs> yeah, and Kizzy, I like how you phrased it, optimistic, but there's urgency to the work that still needs to be done. And I always like to refer to the fact that, again, we have 20,000 local governments in the United States, and you three are representing three of the cities that are probably doing the most. And so we have a long way to go with a lot of the other communities. So, so again, hopefully these best practices and kind of lessons learned can help communities uh, not go ahead and reinvent the wheel, but kind of learn some of the lessons that you guys have been pioneering um, with uh, addressing heat in your communities. So thank you again to the three panelists. Shay, if you want to join us and wrap up the webinar. And while you're doing that, I'll also thank uh, my collaborator, Sarah Miro um, at Arizona State University for presenting um, some of the results from our heat planning survey and the plan integration project that we're working on. So Shay, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, thanks, Lad. 
So I would like to first extend a huge thank you for all participating in this webinar series, for sticking with us. Um, my next thing to tell everyone is that, as you can see on this slide, the uh, 2022 um, Urban Heat Island campaigns, the application just went live today. It'll be open from October 28th until January 14th, um, encouraging cities to apply. Please spread the word and ask cities that may not be on this line to join and fill out an application. Um, additionally, uh, additionally, we will be hosting a special webinar this winter that will cover some points and recap some of this past summer's cities and their reports. So if you like to see what some of the cities from 2021 have done, we ask that you tune in this winter. Let's see, thank you everyone and thanks for attending today. Thank, and thank you to the panelists, special panelists. We appreciate you.